Good morning, everyone, and welcome to our uh, workshop this morning. My name is Larry Rockwell. I'm the Director of Communications and Community Relations here for the ARC of Northern Virginia. The also conference has been muted. For our emergency preparedness workshop. Uh, just a couple quick housekeeping uh, things while we're here uh, is that obviously the emergency exits would be the same doors that you came through. Uh, and restrooms are back down the entry hall and on the right-hand side. For the folks that are joining us on the conference call today, just a reminder that, uh, that your phone lines have been muted during the presentation. However, if you have a question uh, during the workshop, please type it in into the, um, into the interface there on your computer. We will take your questions during the workshop, and we'll be happy to read them on your behalf. And with that, it is my pleasure to introduce Courtney Arroyo from Fairfax County Office of Emergency Management, Preparedness or Management? Management. Fairfax County Office of Emergency Management. And thank you so much for being with us. Today. Yeah, thank you. Um, so I want to start off by doing um, some short introductions, and then I'm going to tell you a little bit about um, why we developed this program and what the purpose is. Um, but my name is Courtney Arroyo. I'm from the Fairfax County Office of Emergency Management. I am the Access and Functional Needs Integration Liaison for our county. Um, I work in emergency management planning, um, and I also do outreach um, specifically to families and individuals with disabilities and access and functional needs. Um, I use this kind of as a two-way street to not only do outreach to help prepare our community, but also as a resource to learn about your families, your needs, and how we can prepare for that um, in, in our agency um, and in the whole public safety community um, so that we can be prepared to serve you as best as possible. Uh, good morning, everybody. My name is Jesse Hayburn. I'm the Public Health Emergency Management Coordinator with the Fairfax County Health Department. Uh, I oversee the program that prepares the county, our residents, health care facilities uh, to respond to the public health impacts of emergencies, anything from acts of biological terrorism to, you know, tornadoes and severe weather, winter storms, things like that. Uh, my name is Maddie Cassidy. I am the recruiting and outreach coordinator for the Department of Public Safety Communications, so that's your 911 center. Um, and I like to come out here and do educational things like this to kind of demystify the 911 system and explain how it works and familiarize you with it. I'm Marshall Field. I'm with the Fairfax County Police Department. I'm the training coordinator for the Crisis Intervention Team. I'm located out of the Merrifield uh, Center. Uh, we work alongside the Sheriff's Department and the Community Services Board to provide uh, outreach and assistance to those that are struggling. Um, we also provide 20, 20 uh, uh, sorry, 10. 40-hour CIT training programs for uh, police officers to teach them about mental illness and how to help people that are in need. Okay. So the purpose of this workshop, um, one of the um, committees that um, Jesse and I both sit on um, is with the Disability Services Board. And um, one of the goals for this year um, and into 2019 is to get out and do um, more community outreach and make um, everyone prepared that we can. So we took the approach of doing a workshop, and this is our first one, so we are so open to feedback, um, and we are so thankful to be here today um, to, to kind of do this and, and see how it works, but we want to be able to make this a, uh, a very interactive workshop, so we're going to go through, we're going to, um, you know, each agency is going to tell you a little bit about what they do um, in terms of specific programming, um, you know, tips and tricks that, that we want you to know about how behind the scenes it works, just like the 911 call center, you know, what's in, what important information it, um, should you be giving them when you call, um, and kind of go from there. Sound good? Terrific. Okay. And I see we do have a guest. He, and I can't remember your, his name, but he, he is part of the Disability Services Board. So, pretty awesome. Okay. Now, do you want to kick it off? Oh, sure. Um, <laughs> um, morning, guys. Um, so, like I said, I'm from the 911 Center, and I'm really here to kind of, I don't know if any of you have ever had to call 911. Yeah. Um, 
but uh, I should be one of the people that you talk to on the other end because they're real people. <laughs> um, and I don't know how familiar you are with the system, but I know before I uh, was a part of the system, I didn't know anything about it. Um, so uh, just so you know, whenever you call 911, you're reaching local people in the jurisdiction that you are. Um, so I work in Fairfax County, I know all the roads, things like that, that's part of my training. Um, when you call the dispatch center, um, we have one central location for the entire county. Um, and in that central location, um, we're routing all the calls for the entire county. Um, we're also taking non-emergency phone calls at our dispatch center. That's something that a lot of people don't know. Um, a lot of times you might think that when you call the non-emergency number, which is a 10-digit uh, number, um, that you're reaching your local police station. You're not. Um, I just as qualified I have all the same resources on my fingertips that would be worth a call 911. And the only difference in the two uh, phone numbers is that the non emergency is kind of a little bit lower. So if somebody was trying to call and say their house was on fire, um, that would go to the first priority call, whereas if you needed to call non-emergency, maybe about a cat stuck in a tree or something like that, um, or maybe you needed uh, some help connecting to a county resource. Um, I've got a lot of phone numbers in a system, and I'm not an expert in everything, but I have a lot of um, resources. If you call the non-emergency number, I could probably point you in a direction of another county organization um, that might be able to help you. Um, so back to 911, if you ever do need to call 911, uh, the first and most important piece of information we'll need from you is where are you? Uh, where is the emergency? Uh, we don't know that. We can't really send you anybody to help that situation regardless of what it is. Um, also, uh, we're going to ask you a lot of questions. Um, I like to remind uh, folks when I get to talk to them face to face, but that doesn't slow down any of your response. Um, we're, our job is to paint a picture for the responders. So once we have enough information to get the responders going, we do that. Um, and someone else sends them while we keep talking to you. Um, and we like to uh, tell them more about what's going on, maybe what color shirt and pants someone's wearing, or um, a better situation. And they can uh, talk to dispatchers separately from what we'll be doing on the telephone. Um, and they'll update them about all that sort of stuff. So when your responder gets there, they don't have to ask you all those questions all over again. They're already current on whatever your situation is. Um, so let's see, what else do I have on my points here? I also wanted to just bring up uh, briefly that we do have the ability in Fairfax County to text 911. Um, I don't know uh, if you guys knew that. Um, but it is an option. Um, of course, every time if you're able to call, that's preferable because we're going to be able to communicate so much faster. Yeah. Um, but if you're in any sort of situation where you can't call or um, speaking would be difficult, anything like that, um, we do have that resource for you in the county. And a lot of our neighboring jurisdictions do as well. And eventually, the entire country will. So um, I guess that's really my PR plus. Do you guys have any questions for me? So if someone has a um, family member that has a disability, what would be the important information that you guys would want to know? Well, um, anything that we're going to need to tell the responders to approach somebody differently, um, that would be something to say. We're not, uh, like I said, we're not experts in any one particular thing. Um, so I, I might not know uh, of anything specific about a disability or anything like that. But if you tell me in plain language that I need to uh, have my responders approach the situation a little bit differently for whatever reason, I can communicate that to them and then they'll be able to carry out your, your wishes in that regard. Does that make sense? Yeah, for example, if you have um, a family member that may, might be sensitive to um, loud noises, you know, we're going to want to know that so we don't scare them as we have our fire or police approaching. So those types of, uh, that type of information um, is really, really helpful to, to be able to pass that along. Any questions, Bob? Can you talk about a location of interest? <laughs> oh, um, yeah, I think that, that uh, that's a, in my purview, but not exactly in my purview. Um, at your local police stations, if you do have any uh, disabilities or functional needs, anything like that, um, I believe you go through your local police station and let, um, they call them a police citizen aid, a uh, person who works the desk at your local station, um, let them know whatever uh, something special about your home. And we have the ability in our computer system, thank you, um, to uh, make a note on that 
location. So anytime, um, if, for example, if you have somebody who's uh, deaf at your house, um, anytime there's a call made for their house, a bubble pops up for us and it says, hey, there's something special about this address. Um, and from, from there, we can click on that and see resident X is deaf or whatever the situation may be so that responders, whether or not you remember to tell us, will have that on file. But you do uh, enter that information through your local police station, um, but then it's in our uh, database uh, globally for any of the dispatchers, whether it's fire, police, call takers, we can all see that information. And what's that called again? Um, we call it a location of interest, um, but I, I don't know exactly from a citizen perspective what you would say, but basically you just want to make a note on your house and they can put it in there for a limited period of time. Um, I haven't seen it because a lot of people don't use it, I think, as, as well as they should. Um, but I believe if you were to even break your leg and you were going to be, you know, if something terrible happened at your home, you needed uh, services for the next six months. Um, they can put a, a, an expiration date on that too. So it'll flag for a period of time and then when it's over, it goes away. Um, or it can be a lifetime thing. Um, we see a lot more of those just because I think people know about it and then they're in there for, <laughs> for life. I do just want to note if that is different than Smart 911. Um, I know we've had a lot of conversations in the community about Smart 911. Fairfax County currently does not have Smart 911. We do have a functional needs registry in addition to that um, that you can sign up for. Um, but it, that system also does not work like Smart 911 where you can log in and update your information. You'll have to go back to the police station and, and make those updates. Does anyone on the phone have any questions? Sure. Okay. Yeah. Um, I'm a member of the, my name is Ayman al which I'm a member of the Fairfax Area Board uh, Disability Services Board, and I'm the subcommittee for transportation in the metro area. I also have a disabled son that is totally dependent on his wheelchair. Okay. He, and he's had three brain surgeries in Georgetown, and we've had to go to the ER. And when we called 911 and they send us an ambulance, the ambulance does not accommodate the wheelchair. Now I understand that you guys are on the delivery end of the service. Mm -hmm. And you have no means of taking a patient to the ER in a wheelchair on an ambulance. Mm -hmm. The ambulance is not accessible to wheelchair bound mm -hmm. people. No. So wheelchair bound people represent like 10% of the entire disabled population that are not uh, uh, provided uh, any kind of uh, ambulance service. Um, so I can say for my purposes, I'm sorry, that that's something that, uh, that happens for you. Um, I, unfortunately, I don't have a very good answer for you because all I'm not looking for an answer. What I'm looking for is you are the practitioners on the team, and your administration needs to hear from you this deficit in the system. We have to have, uh, uh, a, and, and this is not a problem, and I'm not looking that you answer this question, but what I'm looking for is that the system has knowledge of an issue like this that would happen, and it's not an emergency for us, it's an emergency for you too. Um, the ambulance came, could not take my son to uh, 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 Georgetown. Obviously, it's out of the jurisdiction of Fairfax County. Mm -hmm. The ambulances don't go out of the jurisdiction of Fairfax mm -hmm. County. There has to be an exception. Uh, they could not take him in the wheelchair. They would take him on a stretcher, but when you when when he goes to the hospital there, there is no way of uh, of them being able to manage his disability on a stretcher or un, uh, unrestrained. They have restrictions on restraints that our unfortunate legal system does not comprehend or is too uh, extreme about it. Some uh, he. Uh, for example, will injure himself. He will roll off the stretcher to the floor 
maybe break his teeth, maybe open his head. And he already is going to the ER for an emergency related to his brain surgery. So that input has to percolate through your system, and you are the service providers that will face a problem like this once in a while. Now, the solution we had ended up, it, it was like one in the morning. We could not find a, a wheelchair cab to take us to the ER. We got a wheelchair cab from Loudoun County. We woke up the driver who was willing to come and take us. Uh, even look at the service is not a 24-7 service. This is an emergency service that is exceptional. And, and, and if our system can stretch enough to accommodate the special needs of the disability population, it would be wonderful and it would be an example for the nation. And we can definitely, um, unfortunately, the fire department wasn't able to be here today. Um, they're the ones that, that run fire and rescue. Um, so we can definitely bring that information back to them. And I know that, I think we've talked about this um, before as well. Um, so we can definitely, um, we're going we're gonna to put a, a survey together after this um, to send out. So if you could definitely share that in your feedback, I think that that would be um, really good so that we can um, pass that along to them and, and get assistance. Okay. Any other questions? Okay. So the Sheriff's Office, um, they're not able to be here either. Um, there's uh, two different programs that, um, that, we, that we talked about that we wanted to highlight here. Um, one is Project Lifesaver, and that is a program um, that um, individuals that have different disabilities such as autism, um, Down syndrome, and some cognitive disabilities, um, they use a, um, either an ankle or a wristband to help um, track where they are. So, so for example, they have a history of um, running or getting lost or maybe, you know, an older individual has dementia and, um, you know, they're home alone and they insist on taking the car and you've taken away the keys and all that kind of stuff and now we have um, the silver alert out. This band um, will, help tr will help the sheriff's office um, find those individuals quickly by using masks and the transmitting. Do you there's a wait list for it, typically. Yeah. Uh, you have to be honest about that. <laughs> Absolutely, yeah. So there is a wait list. Um, although it is a free service, they, you know, they do suggest that um, you provide donations because it is a very costly program. Um, the program is spread out over over a a large department. Um, they do have a couple hundred people that they service now, and one of the um, the reasons why it is. So expensive, and there is a wait list. Is that every six months the batteries need to be changed? So you're going out and doing a home visit, okay? So um, you know it is something that you can consider, and if you have someone, um, you know, that could use it, get on the wait list, and hopefully, um, you know, you can you'll get up quickly. Um, I think we you from the operational standpoint at the 911 center, and someone who uh, does is a part of a project lifesaver program um, does some of the same while well, we can't find that person. Um, my understanding, you know, I'm not on the back end of that, but for our procedural purposes, we have to notify the sheriff's department, and the way I understand it to be is that even though that person is wearing their uh, bracelet or anklet, it's not constantly always tracking where they are until there's a problem, and then the, when the sheriff's department is notified about it, I think they kind of turn on their, their tracker and start looking at that from, from that perspective. So if, if that does. Uh, to rest. You're not constantly being yeah. interacted. It's when, uh, when you're needed to be. Yeah. It's not a GPS based. Um, they have to go out in the field and locate, triangulate that, that signal mm -hmm. to find the person. So it's not like they're out there tracking your movements. It's a they go out with their, their receivers and they tr triangulate and they find the person. It's a very effective team to find folks. Similar to chips that we now put in our dogs and cats, right? Yeah. So is Project Lifesaver operating from um, the person's nearest sheriff's department, or is it a strictly an office itself, like 
reaching out to the different sheriff offices. So we're talking about Fairfax County. Mm -hmm. The Fairfax County Project Lifesaver is run by the Sheriff's Department. Mm -hmm. So when, when somebody, a family member goes missing, mm -hmm. uh, DPFC contacts the Sheriff's Department who immediately dispatches deputies out into the field mm -hmm. with the receivers. Mm -hmm. So and, and not every jurisdiction has that. We're fortunate that we have that in Fairfax. Mm -hmm. And then, um, does anyone have small children or grandchildren or anyone? <laughs> yeah, we do, right? Um, we both didn't sleep well last night. So. But we were determined to be here today and not cancel this because we were talking about who, um, you know, who has to stay home. It's always like the fight in the morning of whose meetings are more important for that day. We clearly won today. Um, so child IDs, it's also a great program. Um, the Sheriff's Department goes out to a lot of different community events throughout the year. Um, they take the time to meet with families, um, meet the children, take pictures of the children, and they print out this little ID. Um, and you know, usually they'll print out one for mom and dad or someone else um, if they're a primary caregiver for that person. Um, and, and it is great, and you should update it regularly because kids change so much in you know, a year or two years. Um, span, but it could be critical when, if you have a child missing, you know, it, instead of trying to search for a picture and get all this information, it's just an ID. I keep mine right behind, you know, my license, so it's kind of like his license. Um, I use it when flying and, and all this stuff, and it, it is great, um, and it could really excel um, the response from um, public safety in locating a missing child. Um, one thing is, they do not keep the data. So the data is not stored anywhere. So they're taking your kid's fingerprint and they're putting it on the card, but once they, you know, exit out to go to the next kid, the data is not safe because kids are, um, you know, they're growing and everything is changing so fast that they would have a massive database. Um, and they do this, you know, around the county monthly. Is there a similar program like that for adults? They should say an older adult with dementia or, or somebody that doesn't, you know, have a, uh, a driver's you know, license. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, um, so the child IDs um, are up to age 18. After 18, you can get an, um, an ID uh, from the DMV for that person. Um, they, they want to do that um, and control it if you're over 18, um, even if you don't have a driver's license. Um, but that's something that you guys can go do with your family member um, there. And it's an official ID that you can use um, to show proof of residence and all that kind of stuff. Does that answer it, Christian? Yes, Any questions? We're obviously meeting here for, to discuss the uh, uh, matters that uh, are emergency preparedness for people with disabilities. But when we, as a family with a disabled child, interface with any government agency, I think it takes like 45 minutes to go through these privacy requirements. And those privacy assurances should not really be required in, in everything we do with government. They will not speak to the attending nurse that accompanies my son, for example, 24-7. And they will not speak to me unless they have a copy of my guardianship and I'm not walking with the guardianship in my pocket all the time. And it uh, often becomes very ridiculous to be able to uh, accomplish anything. Uh, that way. And I think the privacy laws should be uh, also uh, uh, take a reconsideration, uh, especially in, a, in an emergency. You guys have to deal with something. You, you do take the name verbally and everything, but at, the, at some point, does your system require uh, such restrictions on privacy? Matter? Who's going with the child to the hospital, or who's called 911 to ask for a service for the child? So the privacy law that you talk about is HIPAA. Yeah, it's, a, it's a federal law. We have no control over it in Fairfax County. 
What you need to know, though, is very important, is during an emergency, HIPAA does not apply. So the doctors can share information with law enforcement, with, with you, uh, but you do have to have those guardianships because I, I assume your child is over 18, correct? He is over 18. So because the way the Constitution is written, he has right, everybody has rights. Right. So we have to have those legal documents to show that, hey, you know, you actually do. You might want to put it in maybe electronic format and keep it on a thumb drive with you or something like that. I don't know, but we are very restricted. And it is very frustrating for, for us as well. So I'm trying to help folks uh, because over at Maryfield, we're working with doctors and we're trying to, we have a common goal to service somebody, but sometimes they can't communicate with us what the person's problems are because of the federal law and we have no control of that. And it, it, is, it is a problem, but you know, in an emergency, it does not apply. That's good for you. Thank you. Do you, do you know if you can have a copy of the guardianship? Do you have to have the, the seal on the guardianship info? Like if you have a copy of the original, is that okay? I, mean, with you? I think generally, a, a, yeah, just a copy would be fine. Okay. okay. Yeah. Well, I wonder on the, you know, every year you sign, uh, um, you know, through the community service board, if you have a support coordinator, you sign a, um, a permission of who you, who they can communicate with and stuff like that. But I don't know, you know, I think if somebody has a support coordinator, then they would get involved early on. And you could probably, if you go to Georgetown all the time, <coughs> you could say, like, you know, attending physician at Georgetown University Hospital or something, you know, blanket like that that you do all the time, and maybe that would help. That's a good point. That. You can sign a waiver of that of those rights, and if you have that on file, then that's what the Community Service Board has started to do lately so that we can actually communicate when we're trying to serve somebody. If we have a waiver on file, then they can communicate with whoever you say they can communicate with. Think of the people that you might, you know, be communicating with that year, and then you can, you know, put down the generic. Well, uh, you guys, as far as this type of uh, law uh, or requirement, I think our problems with you represent like two percent of our problems with the with the HIPAA rules. But for example, now the health insurance for people with disabilities has become so complicated, subcontracted, subcontracted, subcontracted for Medicaid. And instead of me contacting Medicaid directly and wasting time to uh, identify myself and, and make sure that they look for the guardianship that I have submitted they will refer me to another subcontractor, to another subcontractor, to another subcontractor. And when my son receives a medication, a letter authorizing a medication that was never prescribed to my son, you talk to anybody and it's, it'll take you two days to resolve. But you are right, the care coordinator has the right over me to resolve the problem in five minutes. So this is a frustration at the receiving end here. And I mean, the problem with uh, uh, emergency services is, is much less obviously, and you've clarified that uh, truly, but it is frustrating in our community to interface with anything related to a complicated uh, uh, government system like this. I, I, I just want to keep moving, keep the program moving forward so that we can stay on schedule. But I think the takeaway from this is in the context of emergency preparedness is that these are wake up calls to additional documents that need to be saved in a, in a ready, ready to grab place in case of emergency. Um, and I think that's probably a big takeaway that a lot of people don't think about as far as emergency planning to have copies of all of those kinds of documents ready to go. Yeah, absolutely. Um, okay, so next we're going to hear um, a little bit about the crisis intervention team, um, kind of what they do. I know we heard a little bit about it, but um, you know, we'll just dive into it a little bit more. So the crisis intervention team is, is kind of, think of it as two different things. The first thing is a training program, and that's what, um, what I'm running. 
that's the 40-hour class that we put on. We've uh, gotten 660 law enforcement officers in Fairfax County through that. That includes the town of Vienna, Herndon, City of Fairfax, City of Falls Church, uh, Northern Virginia Community College, and George Mason University Police Department, Sheriff's Department, Fairfax County, and the Police Department. So uh, we're working hard on pushing these classes out. Uh, the students, the officers usually come not because they want to be there necessarily, to be quite honest with you. Um, it's not an aspect that people generally sign up for in law enforcement, right? So we all say we want to help people when we, when we take the job, and we truly do. But we don't expect to be counselors, right? But that's a big part of what law enforcement is these days. So we, we teach them um, a lot about mental illness and disabilities. Uh, we have a lot of speakers that, that speak from personal experience, so we get that exposure. And um, we give them all the resources. And a big part of what we do is uh, role playing. Uh, we as instructors act as folks with disabilities, and the officers have to interact with us in a proper fashion to show empathy and respect and build rapport. And depending on how they do, it either goes well for them or it doesn't go well for them. And they do that for three days. And they, gen they, they gain a lot of um, good talent in how to deal with folks that, um, that are experiencing different disabilities. And they learn how to identify that. For instance, I, one of the things I show them is a video of a very unfortunate incident that happened in Arizona where a, a child affected by autism is confined by a law enforcement officer in a known drug area. He's a drug recognition expert. He's thinking drugs when he interacts with this, this fellow. Well, the fellow says, I'm stimming. Officer has no idea what stimming is. And they get into a physical confrontation because the, the, the individual tries to walk away. So what the officers learn is, well, now that I have this knowledge, I know that I wouldn't go hands-on with this person. So there's a lot of good, uh, in that 40 hours, they gain a lot of knowledge on how to, how to deal with folks, how to understand folks, how to let people vent. Some folks are, um, if they're in a manic, manic state, we allow them some space to move. We don't isolate them and make them sit down because that's not going to work for them. Um, but also, that we still have to be safe in how we do our job. So it's kind of a balancing act. Um, but officers come through that class and they gain a lot of knowledge. So that's the first part. The second part is we have 15 of us assigned over here at Merrifield that are full-time crisis intervention officers. And what we do is we help folks that come through the system and get them into either voluntary or involuntary hospitalization to protect themselves. Um, so what we do is we take custody of folks if they're in custody from the patrol officers, and we're especially, you know, that's all we do, we're pretty good at it generally, but we're able to build rapport and, and get families and then folks through the system of getting help and treatment, um, whether it be voluntary or involuntary. As, a, as opposed to um, putting them into jail correct. and it not being the correct after action from whatever they did. Yes. Diversion first is a huge priority mm -hmm. in Fairfax County right now. We get anywhere between 200 and 250 police cases that come into our doors at Merrifield every month. 200 to 250. 25% of them are jail diversions. They could have gone to jail or been charged. 25% of 200 to 250 per month we're jail diverting right now. We're doing a really good job. We're trying to do an even better job. But that is a huge increase. We started in uh, January of 2016, and we had about 25 to 30 cases per month coming through with, with law enforcement. Now we're up to 200 to 250, 25 percent of which are not going to jail. They're getting mental health assistance. So that's huge, and we're trying to we're trying to be even better at it. Um, but the system is very overloaded. I have to be very honest about that. The, the mental health system is tremendously overloaded, and there's a lot being done behind the scenes to try to affect that. But unfortunately, we're kind of in a we're kind of a victim of our own success. Okay, so we're training all these officers, and we're, we're bringing all these folks through. Instead of going to jail, they're going into the mental health facility. The problem is we don't have enough beds, and it's not just a Fairfax County problem. It's not just a Virginia problem. It's a national problem. Um, and there's a history of the, as to how that came about. The problem is we just don't have the funding right now. And any advocacy that you guys can do would help us greatly to service our folks. Okay. Any questions? Any I, questions on the phone? I want to applaud um, Fairfax's CIT training, uh, particularly that you also do the role playing, because I feel that's so necessary. My name is Jennifer, and I've been five years with the Arc of Loudoun County. We offer Loudoun Sheriff's Department and the town of 
the Spring Police Department once a month CIP training on our campus. So they have classroom time and they also walk the campus into our schools and see what these behaviors are like amongst the young people and how the staff ABA trained respond. Um, but I've been encouraging us and encouraging us to do that role playing part of it because if you're totally new to disability, you just can't comprehend it until you face it. Mm -hmm. well, Loudon, I'll tell you, Loudoun County, Prince William County, Arlington, Alexandria, their CIT training is identical to ours in Fairfax. Mm -hmm. It's the Memphis model, it's, an, it's not just a, a Virginia model, it's mm -hmm. not just a national model, it's an international model. So I could go down to Stanton, Virginia, and assist in teaching their class because it's exactly the same, it, it's a, a recipe, it's not customized to the jurisdiction. The only difference being in Fairfax, we spend a little bit more time talking about veterans for obvious reasons, right? We have a huge veteran population. So we spend a little bit more, we can tweak it here and there for the, for the area, but I'm telling you, next month I'm going out to Loudon to help them teach their class because it's the mm -hmm. same thing. Mm -hmm. That's awesome. We probably need to attend the same class ourselves. Because when when you are gifted with a disabled and you disabled child, you have no experience on how to deal with any kind of disability. Uh, well, NAMI is a great resource. Are you familiar with NAMI, National Alliance for Mental Illness? Uh -huh. Great resource for families. They have they have groups, um, and I've seen that firsthand where one parent has, is attending NAMI and other isn't. And I can see the difference in the interaction of the child. It's just tremendous. I mean, they, that's a great resource, and I highly encourage NAMI to anybody that, that has to deal with that because it's a great resource. And you're with other parents in the exact same situation as you. And you can learn from each other, and that's what happens. Great resource. I have a question. If you do detain someone with a mental disability, and you recognize the mental disability, and he is untethered, at one point, do you? Uh, try, attempt to find contact of advocates that can speak on his behalf or can represent. So, if, if it's an involuntary, is that what you're talking about? Okay. <coughs> involuntary? I didn't detain him from the community. Okay. So, that'd be involuntary. So, what that would be would be called an emergency custody order. So, law enforcement has the ability and the responsibility to take somebody into custody. We try to make it. Um, so that they, they go along with it, obviously. Um, but an emer emergency custody order is an eight-hour time frame that we can bring somebody in to be evaluated by a mental health professional. So we have eight hours to get that done. If that mental health professional in Maryfield feels the person needs to be involuntarily detained, then they call in a temporary detention order. So <clears throat> then, the, then they have to find a bed, which is the big challenge. It takes hours. They have to call all over Virginia. We take people down to Stanton. We take people all over the state to so wherever the bed is. So that's a three-day period of, it's basically keeping somebody safe for three days. Right. Now there is treatment and there is medication offered, um, but it's basically keeping somebody safe. At a, there's a hearing at the third day, and at that hearing is where they have a, an appointed attorney. And that attorney represents what that individual wants. Not necessarily what's best for them, it's not a guardian in light, it's what that mm -hmm. person wants. They have legal representation. And then the uh, special justice determines whether that person needs to be detained further or whether they should be released. Oftentimes they're released. But it's a temporary solution to a lifelong problem. That's the issue. And but what the gentleman I think was asking was everything that you described can take place for an adult without his caregiver being contacted or notified. Mm -hmm. Correct. I mean, and there, his question was, is there a point where somebody who has an intellectual or developmental disability is afforded the opportunity to have their caregiver? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. The very first thing that we do is try to locate right. the caregiver and the family. In other words, you can access that kind of net support network if you contact the Community Services Board or if you can affect Family Services. Oh, you know, you can just call your investigator and say, could you call and see if there's somebody who knows this person? And the other thing, you, you may actually save the system the funding to find a bed and to transport them way out of the county and, and to complicate the lives of their support system. And I, I'll, be, I'll be honest with you, I don't know if I'm answering your question, so correct me if I'm wrong, but I'm going to tell you, folks with intellectual disabilities, Temporary detention is really not a good option, generally. 
Sometimes it's the only option to keep people safe, but it's not a cure to the problem, and we, we try to avoid uh, involuntary detention of those folks whenever we possibly can, because it, it's not, it's, it's, it's keeping somebody safe for three days. That's really all it is. So it's not a solution. Does that make sense? I don't know if I answered that question. It does make sense, but what, I'm, what, I, what, what I was trying to say is you're, you're a portion of government, and you have access to other government departments, and there is the department that would make your life and your responsibility uh, uh, to execute any, uh, uh, dealing with any uh, uh, person with mental disability instantly. Call family services at nine in the morning. Who's uh, 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 the care coordinator for this guy? And that care coordinator can can open doors for you. And that's exactly what they do at Maryfield. The, the clinicians there do that. We don't do that. Yeah, and that's, that's in place. Yeah, and I will say, not every agency like us. We can't just call family services and start asking questions about someone to try to get information to reach their. You know, they they have all that information protected, um, and they you know they do have privacy laws um, in effect. So we we can't just call like for example during an emergency. Um, if we have um, right now, there's a fire going on at a group home, and that's a real life thing that's happening. Um, there is a fire, and you know they might be trying to get in touch with um, you know individuals from. Um, their, their support team that might be out of state or they might be local, but I can't just call family services and say, hey, do you have their contact information? That's privacy. You know, I, I, don't, I'm, I don't have privy to, their, to their, all their records. Um, so we have to follow the proper protocol and go through the steps in order to, to properly get that information. I certainly respect that and I respect the uh, chair's uh, input that uh, during an emergency, HIPAA does not apply. So, in this case, uh, it could be very helpful if you have in mind that HIPAA does not apply. In other areas of government, you're dealing with a, a an emergency service in the community that's very well recognized, and uh, it can be helpful. A lot of people. I think what the gentleman is suggesting is that in the cases where you can. If you can reach out to the community service board, you can reach out to the Absolutely. That, that, should, that, that is a resource that can be called. Yeah. Well, yeah. I guess, is there, you know, I'm wondering if there's a way with privacy and all that, that if there's a way that, you know, first you have to have the person's name, which I have a son with severe autism who's 26 who doesn't have the capacity. Well, he could say, he can say his name, but you might not understand him and things like that. You know, and that's my biggest fear is that, that, you know, having some way that maybe they could be flagged, you know, that this is a place to go, you know, that has the information because in terms of, he can be very aggressive, I mean, like, really uh, super aggressive, and in a situation like that, the fear of flight kicks in, and he's quite phenomenal, you know, he's the person that things can go bad wrong. But he has extensive behavior plans and stuff, and in terms of his is address the issue, and there usually is an issue, and back off, and you know, give him medication or whatever, and then he stabilizes. But you know, it's scary when he <coughs> he doesn't even carry an ID. He's always with somebody, but he doesn't carry his own ID because he would just throw the wallet away or whatever because it doesn't, and he's not with me all the time anymore. So. share my email address. Um, is, is there a way to follow up with everybody? Yeah. I'll share my email address and anybody that if you want me to check um, our records management system um, for your son, I'm sure he's probably in there. Um, I can put a note in there. I can flag like so if an officer ever runs him, it'll say you know severe autism, 
doesn't respond well to touching, whatever the special, you know, if you met one child with autism, you met one child with autism, right? Everybody's different. So we can, right, so we can, we can put that information in the, into our, it's called an iLeads, it's our records management system. I'd be happy to do that for anybody that would like that. And we can also add a picture. I can put a picture in there. I I just like to say the two times that I have called the police with my two sons, um, they both were very good interactions. Yeah, hopefully they went through our training. I, I can say as well, I don't know um, where you live or what places at your local police station. And this is out of my realm, but I have gone to police stations myself in the Um And some of the local police stations, if there's a uh, you know, the officers that patrol your neighborhood or, or where you go are generally the same. They work different shifts, but they're generally the same officers. And I know of at least one police station in Fairfax County where they kind of keep a binder. Uh, and I think they generally are using it more for like folks with dementia or things like that, people who might wander off. But, you know, if somebody in this particular neighborhood, they come across them at the station, that person can look to a photo that their families provided, some of their triggers, tips, things like that. Um, and so I think we're well, I'm in West Springfield, and I did, <laughs> I did provide um, information on yes. my kids' families from the Yeah, so, so the, I would hope for you that the officers that are controlling where your kids would be are more or less familiar with, you know, that sort of stuff. So even if um, they came across it, they might have a at least a ballpark idea. Um, does the sheriff have access to take information from her and input it into? You have access to the system, and the system is a government property, and government has to communicate with government. It's exactly like the FBI does not communicate with the CIA, even though they're both security, uh, uh, fulfill security functions. So this, maybe the system can be helpful. So we're, we're just trying to brainstorm uh, 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 helpful ideas uh, with you. And, and I'm sure on the other end, you also face uh, restrictions. And all we're asking as a disability community is you can help us the, uh, this way. And if it does not apply in emergencies, this is all we need. And HIPAA does not apply, let me be clear, HIPAA does not apply to law enforcement. Okay, you're talking about medical doctors in the medical community, that's what HIPAA applies to. So if you, you give me information about your family member and I put it in our system, the dispatchers, when they dispatch, can pull that up and, and alert the officers on the way. And we can share that information. That's not protected information. It's medical information amongst medical doctors and people in the medical field is what HIPAA applies to. It's, it's unfortunate. It had great intentions when I implemented it, but we can't do anything about it unless you change federal law. I have a question about um, uh, if you um, need to take uh, someone with a disability, uh, with a disability to to arrest uh, or mm -hmm. to with you, is somebody from a family or, or a close friend or somebody who's in the vicinity of this person allowed in the in the car? Yeah. Police vehicle. It, that's that? individual officer discretion deal. Um, if you are a help, I'm going to take you with me. Okay. If you're a hindrance, I'm not going to. Right. Makes sense. Uh, but not every officer is going to do it that way. Right. Uh, but you would definitely follow to Maryfield, and they're going to want you at Maryfield for the evaluation. You're going to be a part of it. about like uh, teasing or calming the Absolutely. Family. And that's what we teach the officers in the CIT training is right. do whatever you can. If having a family member riding in the back with the person or in the front seat helps, then use that help. Make it easier for everybody. That's what we're training officers. Okay. So I know we talked a little bit about going to, um, you know, visit your local police station. Um, fire and rescue um, couldn't be here today, um, but I do have a couple items um, of programs that they do have. Um, and the message that, um, you know, Chief Bailey wanted um, the community to know is get out there and go to your local fire department. Um, let them know who you are. Um, let them know if you, you know, have any special needs. Um, and just become familiar with them. Um, they do have A, B, and C shifts, so you know there there could be different shifts on in different days. 
Um, but they share information. Um, and they usually, um, I know at, at my local station, they have a list of individuals that um, kind of are like the points of interest um, of where they are, if they have special needs, um, so that if they're responding to that um, particular house or, or building, they know what they're coming to. Um, at your local station, um, you can get, there's two different, two different programs. Um, and we have a, we get requests for these all the time. Uh, the file of life, um, which is a form that's kept on your fridge. Um, we suggest that you fill it out in pencil because medical stuff is always changing. Um, but if it's on your fridge or next to your nightstand, um, you know, that's a place where we can um, share with the first responders what critical medication you're taking, um, critical medical information, emergency contacts, and such. Um, and then also the Yellow Dot program. So the Yellow Dot program um, is a program that is for vehicles. So if you are in an accident, um, you know, you can, um, if you have gone and filled out the medical information with the um, fire department, they will put the Yellow Dot on your vehicle and they will know where to go get it in case of an emergency. Um, when we're talking about medication, we're not talking about if you take a baby aspirin every day um, or if you take acid reflux medicine. We're talking about life-sustaining medication. So, for example, I have Crohn's disease. I take an intravenous medication on a schedule. If I don't have it, I could become really ill. Um, so I need to keep on that medication schedule. So um, every month, my stuff is written in pencil so I can write down when my next infusion is supposed to be. and you would know. I also can't take different medications that will interact with it um, because it will cause a lot of different issues. So those types of, that type of information is what we really um, want to know through those programs. Um, the last one is a visual smoke detector program. Um, so for individuals who are deaf and hard of hearing in the community, um, we do have a visual smoke detector program where the fire department will come out and install um, the visual smoke detector. Uh, they will also install a bed shaker, um, you know, in case there's, um, if someone is deaf and blind, um, they will install the bed shaker that will um, be able to wake them up and alert them if the fire alarm is going off. Okay. And again, you can vis visit any um, local fire department for um, those programs. Any questions? And I do have a brochure that goes along with this PowerPoint that mm -hmm. has all of this information. So, um, you know, and it has my contact information. So if you have specific questions, um, feel free to email me, um, and I can direct you to the to the right person. Okay. 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 Um, so, <clears throat> from the health department's perspective, um, the health department has clinics all over the county, and they're providing services every day. Um, what I want to talk about is where, where my job comes into play when there are um, large-scale disease outbreaks, um, you know, acts of biological terrorism, any kind of emergency that's going to require a large number of individuals in the community to receive um, public health or medical services. Um, I have some information for you just to kind of understand what to expect if you need to go to one of those types of facilities and then how to, how to prepare for some of your own, you and your family's health and, and medical needs uh, for emergencies. So, um, like I said, the health department is providing regular services every day, and every day there are disease outbreaks in Fairfax County. That is not uncommon anywhere. Um, what we prepare for, what my team in particular prepares for, are the very large outbreaks that might affect hundreds or thousands of people in the county where you may have been exposed uh, to an infectious disease because you were in a grocery store at the same time that someone had measles or something, or um, your child or a family member um, attended school for and was in the same classroom for a long period of time with someone who has infectious tuberculosis and things like that. That's when my team comes into play to, to respond to those kinds of very large outbreaks. And when we do that, um, sometimes, and H1N1 is a really good example, it's probably the only example where we've had to be thousands of people at one time, um, we're going to set up facilities for the public to come to us to receive medication. 
Um, now, those facilities are typically going to be very large, very brightly lit, very crowded, and very noisy. Um, so that is going to present some challenges um, to a good segment of our population. So what I, what I want you to know is, first and foremost, any facility like that, we plan to ensure there are no stairs that anyone will have to traverse, that is completely wheelchair accessible, and so on and so forth. However, what we cannot plan for is um, you know, meeting the needs of 100% of the population um, who may need some special um, services or a special location. So what we do, the same, same way as my 911 colleague mentioned, anytime you come up to a health department emergency response facility, you're going to be greeted by a greeter, someone who's just there to provide you whatever form you may need or to provide, provide you some direction. If you tell that first person you encounter what you or your family member needs in plain language, they're going to make it happen for you. So if you tell them, you know, hey, you know, the lights or the noise may be um, a little bit of a challenge for us, we have pre-planned quiet rooms. So uh, there are places outside of kind of the fray of the large response where you can receive all the services of that facility kind of separate from that. So if you can tell us in plain language what we need, um, we're going to do our best to, to make it happen. We have about 800 employees. Um, they all receive some very basic level of kind of awareness training, but they won't all be experts. They won't all necessarily know exactly how to meet the need, but if you can tell them, they're going to make it happen for you. Um, the other thing I'll say is um, H111 is not a great example because we did need to provide some uh, or get from you some medical information because the vaccine and there could be some, um, some issues there. But for very large outbreaks, and we're providing medication, particular pills like antibiotics, we are not asking for ID. We don't care if you live in Fairfax County. Um, we don't care if you can show us an ID. Um, we can, you can pick up for your entire family without bringing them to the facility. Um, so we are not trying to collect a lot of information. We're not trying to put up any barriers. If you know the first name and the last name of the person you want to pick up medication for, you're going to be able to get medication for that person without bringing them to one of our facilities. Now, the, obviously the exception to that is if you need to get a vaccine. And we're going to need, we're going to need their arm for that. Um, but like I said, if you, if you tell us right up front, that first person you encounter what you need, we're going to make sure that you get it so that everyone can, can get our services. Um, to, the, to the gentleman's point, kind of a, as an aside for a moment, um, I, I agree completely that it is a problem that one government department system does not talk to the other government department system. Uh, and that is pretty common, unfortunately, in our government and pretty much every other government system in the country. Um, from the human services side of things, so health department, CSB, family services, a couple others. Um, they have identified that as a problem because we found the health department is providing services to this person. We're maybe giving them back to <coughs> or giving them the travel immunization. <coughs> DFP is providing services to that same person, different mm -hmm. services. Family services is providing services to that person. And we have no idea what the other departments are providing them. So um, the human services agencies are building a system now, it's currently in development, so that we all just share the same system. And so if you're coming to the health department for the first time, we can look you up and we can say, oh, well, they've used other health, or excuse me, Fairfax County services, and here's what we know about that to provide them better service. So we're working on it, we're trying. Um, it's a, it's a long-term thing, but I hope it, it starts to, to meet some of those barriers. Um, on the HIPAA front, we have the same kinds of challenges. In an emergency, it is extremely loosened for us as well. It's not quite. Uh, to the extent of law enforcement, but it's much loosened so that, again, we're not putting up barriers to being able to provide service. We can share the information we need to share with our colleagues so that we can meet the needs of, uh, of our residents. Um, as far as preparedness for health and medical stuff, I cannot strongly enough encourage you to write down on paper mm -hmm. doctors, primary care physicians, and specialists' names, phone numbers, addresses, what prescription medications you and your family members take, the dosage, the frequency, the whole works. Keep that with you. Everyone keeps it in their phone now, and the moment that the severe weather has kept power out for over 24 hours and you can't recharge your phone, you can't call your doctor. Some people don't remember their doctor's name. Um, I, I'll stop my head. I, honestly, I can't tell you what my primary care physician's name is. It's in an app on my phone. Now, I have it written down. It's at home. It should be with me. 
could be in my car. But um, so you, you really have to do that because very often, particularly in, in um, shelter settings, very recent example of the large apartment fire in, in back in May in a senior living apartment complex mm -hmm. where the whole a complex built, uh, burned down and 50, 60 um, senior living and individuals with active functional needs needed to come to a shelter that Fairfax County was running. Of course, it was they they ran out of their homes. They mm -hmm. of course they didn't go run and grab their prescription meds. So now they're in a place they don't have their prescription meds and they don't know what their the name of the meds are. They don't know how to contact their doctor. In some cases they don't know the doctor's name. We can get you those medications, but we can't get them if we don't know what they are. Mm -hmm. um, so having that stuff on paper, in addition to your phone, I, I just cannot stress that enough. Um, Courtney, I'm sure she'll talk about it, has the um, kind of the waterproof envelope that you're supposed to put kind of the, the deed to your house and the, your cars and your important stuff. Also put the copy of your, of your medical insurance policy mm -hmm. in there and these copies of phone numbers and copies of your prescription medications that you use. Mm -hmm. I know they're going to change from time to time, but keep them updated and keep them in there. Um, and keep them on you if you need to, but um, that's, that's the, the best thing you can do to prepare for health and medical, other right. than, you know, kind of making sure in advance of emergencies that you've contacted your doctor or your pharmacy mm -hmm. and you get additional stores of meds. If you use durable medical equipment, get an additional supply, seven to ten days we recommend, before uh, enough for seven to ten days. Um, not everyone keeps that on hand, but if, in, you know, for example, Florence, is coming down the pathway, that's your opportunity, you know, five to seven days in advance, go get some extra medication, go get extra batteries for your durable medical equipment or extra supplies, whatever it is you need to, to have in advance. That's the kind of stuff we are probably not going to be able to give you, at least not quickly. We don't just keep that kind of equipment and supplies um, on hand. Um, we can get it if we know what you need, but it's going to be much better that you be able to kind of meet the needs of your family on your own. Mm -hmm. Any questions about health department? So. Okay. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. It's just a bit a lot, but far off the subject. But I just want to, in a lighter note, or maybe not a serious note, um, this too takes us care of the larger scale disasters. Mm -hmm. So, how ready are we in this area? So, New York is just need to be for a chemical or you know, emergency. So I'll tell you that we are very ready for a biological attack. Mm -hmm. um, that happens to be my purview. Um, chemical le less so, that's less, less the, the health department, um, but for biological types of attacks, every jurisdiction in Northern Virginia region, Loudoun, and, and everyone around us um, prepares for large scale, um, not even just acts of biological terror, just large, you know, a new novel flu strain or something mm -hmm. like that. We um, have purchased and stockpiled the equipment and supplies needed to dispense to our entire population. Um, we have pre-established the facilities in which we would do that and uh, the floor plans for those facilities, how everything's spread out and where our staff is and where clients come through and all that kind of stuff. Um, we have pre-written the public messaging to the extent that we can so we can immediately get out the information you're going to need to know if you're going to have to come to one of my very large clinics. Um, so, you know, are we completely prepared? No, there's never a complete, you know, you're never done, but we're, about but we're very that. prepared. Is there something, though, that as a public service, people can be aware of, like, what's the best, uh, how to proceed if there's, like, an alert, like, let's say a terrorist attack, a biological mm -hmm. terrorist attack, how good the, the, the household take precautions? So, you think so I think that's where... I think that's where I'm going to come in, and I'm going to talk a little bit about this in a minute. Um, but we do have a new plan coming out called the Community Emergency Response Guide, and that's really going to talk about the different hazards that we have here in our county, um, what mitigation steps you can take beforehand, how you can prepare, what you do during, and then what you do after. And for each of those hazards, we're going to have steps for families to take. And the, one of the approaches that um, we're going to be rolling out is a neighbor-to-neighbor -neighbor model. And it's a five-step neighborhood guide that's going to help you build a community within your community. There's a um, participant on the, on the computer that just has a question. He's wondering about contact information for the health department. Oh, um, so, um, yeah, you, you can contact the health department. The website is www.fairfaxcounty.gov health. 
And then the health department's main number, I'm just going to double check it here real quick while I'm on the line, is 703-246-2433. And for those in the room um, and anyone on the line as well, I'll leave some business cards um, here at the end. Um, I, I'd love to hear from you um, if you have any um, thoughts on how the health department can better prepare to, to meet the needs of our residents in an emergency, I, I want to hear them. So I'll leave my contact information. Do you want to talk at all about food safety? Um, yeah, so um, very quickly on food safety, um, which is uh, not my area of expertise, uh, but we have a whole uh, wing of the health department who does it. Um, really the key for, for food safety in an emergency um, is you want to, as much as possible, rely on non-perishable foods. Um, because you, the more you open your refrigerator when your power is out, um, the more it's going to lose um, it, the, the cold that's in there, and the temperature of the food will rise. And if the temperature of a food is above 41 degrees, it is no longer safe to eat. Um, so the kind of, you know, especially if you have kids that go in and out, you're pretty quickly going to be out of temperature to keep your food safe. Um, so as best as possible, you want to keep that closed. Rely on non-perishable food. Have a, I'm stealing your thunder a little bit, but have a, uh, a non-electric can opener um, available in your stockpile of supplies there in your home. And then again, that website, fairfaxcounty.gov slash health, there's an entire section on food safety that's going to give you a lot of details, including, you know, how to, how to kind of prep your kitchen and how to cook so that the, the raw chicken is not near the, the, you know, the other stuff. There's tons of information on there. There's flyers you can print out and pass out to other groups. And, you know, uh, and our environmental health folks will also come out and, and do inspections for, you know, if you have mosquito problems or you have questions about food safety or questions about how restaurants are inspected and maintained in a sanitary way, we have, we have folks at the health department who, who are happy to chat with you about it. All righty. Okay. So turning to the, I'm going to stand up um, just because I need to stretch my legs. Um, so turning to the emergency management piece. So we talked a lot about what you can do to kind of prepare your, prepare your family um, in terms of documents, in terms of what to, um, you know, say when you're, when you're talking to 911, what information is important for police, fire, and the sheriff. So part of that is preparing, right? You have to take the time for your family to put this all together. Does it take time? Yes. I will not lie to you. You have to invest in doing that. Um, you have to maintain it. You have to sustain it. Um, it's a commitment that you're making to yourself and your family to make sure that they're prepared. Um, so in the back, I have a bunch of stuff for you um, to take home that will help you start this process, okay? Um, it can be fun to get your family involved. You know, uh, for example, you said you're, uh, you have a son with autism. Um, you know, what, what special things keep him active, right? Is there something particular that he likes? Is there a book? Is there a TV show? Electricity. Electricity. Well, guess what? You know what we can get out? A hand-cranking radio that has a USB port that he can crank to get that electricity. How's that? Right? So thinking about those things, you know, if, if we have someone that's very dependent on the phone and an electronics, how can we keep our electronics charged during an emergency, right? The hand cranking radio might just be out of solution, right? Because it's going to give power to your, your cell phone. It might be cranking for a long time, but guess what? It's going to keep them occupied, right? That's, that's the key, okay? So with anyone, I have a one-year-old, okay? How do you keep a one-year-old occupied during an emergency? You buy all the stuff at the dollar store that they've never seen before, and you stash it away in your emergency bag, and you only let them play with it when you're practicing for an emergency or when there is a real emergency. Okay. Um, so in the back, I have information on how to make a family plan. Okay. Um, there's a little booklet there on putting together a family communications plan. So that's going to kind of walk you through the steps of. There's an emergency. Who are you know? Who are my alternate contacts? Who are um, my medical contacts? Um, you know what? Who you should contact in town and out of town? Because during 9/11, you know we weren't able to call out. Um, so you might still be able to send a text message or use social media to check in on on um, 
Facebook to let your family know that, that you're okay, all right? Um, this information should go in your emergency kit as well, okay? So when we're talking about building an emergency kit, there's a couple different kits that we want to build. We want to build a shelter in place kit. That's where we're going to stay in our home. So if, it's, you know, if we get a really big snowstorm, um, a blizzard that dumps 30 inches of snow, and we're at home for a couple days, do you have that stuff all together so your family's safe? There's no power. We definitely need a can opener. We want to make sure we're using non-perishable foods as much as possible. Um, there are some disaster, what they call like disaster recipes, where you can actually make like different salads and stuff from, from canned food. Um, and it's actually it's quite good. We had the health department come out and do um, a demonstration at an event, and it was actually it was actually really cool. I was like, wow, I'm gonna make this on a regular basis because it was awesome. But I never would have thought it. You know, I would think of Chef Boyardee and that kind of stuff. But people who have dietary restrictions can't eat that type of stuff. So you want to make sure that you're putting um, food in there that works for your family. Um, prescriptions. That should also go in your, in your shelter in place box. Um, but you should also have a bag, what we call a go bag. Um, and that's where we do have a, um, a waterproof bag back there with a list of documents that you should keep. That should go in your go bag. So if there is a fire, for example, like we saw at the Forest Glen, um, you know, not one person had an emergency kit. Not one person knew their medication. They didn't know their doctors. They didn't know a lot of stuff, right? They just ran out. Some people didn't even have shoes on. Um, but if you had that bag ready to go and your fire alarm's going off and you're running out your front door, grab the bag, right? At least you'll have something with you. It's better than nothing. Um, so the more time you invest in putting this stuff together and thinking it through, the bigger your bag's going to get, but there's tips on how to, you know, keep it light. Mm -hmm. All right. So think of the things that, that you would need. Um, staying informed. So has everyone signed up for Fairfax uh, Alert? Yeah? Are you guys signed up for Loudon Alert? Yeah, I do. Okay. So Fairfax Alerts is our county's um, free public alerting system. Um, during the time of an emergency, we're going to send out emergency information. On a regular basis, we send out traffic alerts and weather alerts. Um, we do keep a functional needs registry. Um, this is a voluntary registry for individuals who have disabilities. Um, we recently added a caregiver category, so individuals who take care of a family member or, um, or it might be a nurse who's, you know, who's traveling to different patients. So they can get up-to-date information. Um, on a monthly basis, we send out uh, a newsletter that goes out with some preparedness tips. Um, this month, we, yesterday was the Great Southeast Shakeout, so we sent out information on how to prepare um, for an earthquake. So if you had someone in a wheelchair, uh, you could adapt um, the drop cover hold on to that person. Um, if you were using a walker um, or a cane, how you can just adjust to your own personal situation. Um, and we, we do that on a, month, on a monthly basis. We also have our emergency blog, um, and that has the most up-to-date information during an emergency. You can go online and see that. We, we are on social media. Um, and like I said before, communication tips during an emergency, texting instead of calling, uses less battery. Um, utilizing social media such as Facebook to check in to let your friends and family know that you're okay, it works. Okay, I had a uh, family in Puerto Rico during Hurricane Maria. Um, besides seeing pictures on Facebook of them from someone I had no idea, I knew they were okay because they were able to check in. Um, but if that's the only way that you're able to communicate, for, for us it was several months since that's how we were communicating back and forth, because you couldn't FaceTime, you couldn't, you know, you couldn't connect a call. Um, you know, it, it's a very powerful tool to be able to use. Mm -hmm. So in the back, um, as we wrap up, I just want to kind of give you a, a little snapshot of, of what to grab. So we have some um, emergency preparedness starter kits for you to take home that has some of the items that's on a checklist in the back so that you can, we want you to put together an emergency kit. Mm -hmm. So we're giving you some of these items that will help check off your box, right? Some of those things that you might not think about. Um, but add to it. Make it your own. Personalize it. 
Um, if anyone uses assistive technology, um, I think you know that kind of goes along with medical equipment. Um, if you use something, for example, a wheelchair, um, we have cards back there, and you can fill out your information, and on the back, um, it gives you an opportunity to write down how to use it. So if someone uses, um, I, ha I have come in contact with a gentleman who uses an iPad to communicate. He is nonverbal. Um, and the way that his iPad works is he has a little um, dot that goes on his head, um, and it's a sticker. And they put the sticker on every morning, and that's how he communicates and um, types out sentences, which is so cool. But if I don't have the dot, or I don't have an emergency stash of the dot, guess what? He can't communicate with me. And then I don't know what he needs, and it's not that he can't communicate because he's, he's, he's high-functioning. He just is nonverbal. So we want to make sure that you know that information is there. Where do I get the stickers if I don't have them? And those kind, that kind of stuff because he might not be with his caregiver that will know all that information, and he's not going to be able to explain it to me. Um, in the back, we also have um, what we call Z cards. They are pocket cards that you can put in your wallet um, or in your bag that you can write down all your communication information, your medical information. Um, anything that's important, you know, for example, if, um, you know, you guys come across and you're, you're looking for an ID, you might be able to pull out this contact card, and there's your contact for your caregiver. Um, and then there's a brochure in the back for the workshop today um, that just has a, a lot of general information, um, some, uh, some more in-depth information that we have in the PowerPoint that we just talked about, um, and then the document bag. So I have a bunch of those with me, so feel free to take a few. Um, put one in your car, put one in your go bag, put one in your shelter and place kit, and you know, actually use the checklist and put the stuff in there. If your house burns down, you are going to be so thankful that you have that information. That's why we put it together. And just remember, every six months, so right now if you put it together, you're good, right? You're good for quite a few months because we're coming up on daylight saving time. Right. So daylight saving time is when we want you to update your kit. So twice a year, check the batteries in your smoke detector. If your smoke detector is over 10 years old, it needs to be replaced. Um, same goes with the carbon monoxide detector. Um, and then you're also going to want to update your emergency bag. That means changing out the clothes in your emergency bag, making sure that you have appropriate seasons. It went from summer to winter um, in like five days. So that's the time where I'm going to take out my flip flops and I'm going to take out my summer clothes and I'm going to put my winter clothes in. Okay. Reminder, I totally need to do that. Haven't done it yet. It's something I definitely have to go home and do. Um, even the documents, as you renew your car insurance, your homeowners, your renters, um, all those things that you have to do annually, Get a copy and put it in your bag. We have a suggestion or a um, or a tip from somebody online sure. specific to your documents kit, and that is to remember to make extra copies, specifically for family members that may be separated at the time of an emergency incident. One kit at home will not do you any good if both parents are at work and your children are at school. Absolutely. So the online participant has that reminder to make copies and make sure that each person has a set. Yeah, and that's why we, we do suggest a shelter-in-place kit, a go kit, and a vehicle kit. Okay. Just remember, and I have people tell me, oh, yeah, it's in my car, sorry. And I ask them, well, where do you park your car in there? And they tell me in the garage. I'm like, okay. He said, but if your house is on fire, are you opening your garage to take your car out? Or are you getting out of the house? You're probably just getting out of the house. So it's not going to do you much good. But if you're not home, it's going to do you a lot of good, right? Yeah. Uh, I just want to mention, I don't know if you mentioned when I stepped out real quickly, but a lot of people, when you start talking about the number of kits you need and everything, people start kind of worrying about the cost. Chances are you have almost everything you need already. It's just putting it in. You don't have to buy all this stuff, with the exception of, I don't know, water and some food and stuff like that. But and you can really do it, you know, without it, you know, being a, a detriment to your budget. And go to the dollar store. Literally, a lot of the stuff, you know, if you don't have it at home or you don't have extras, 
you know, as we're talking about um, hygiene kits, right? So if you if you're putting, you know, those little travel um, so hand sanitizer, all that kind of stuff, go to the dollar store, right? You get, for like ten dollars, you could get everything that you need. Um, you know, it's it's. The time is really the investment. The time is the investment that you're putting into your family. Um, and it, yeah. Jesse's right. It doesn't yeah. cost a lot to put this together. I don't think I bought one single thing to put in my kit. It was just stuff that I had. Um, but if you are thinking about, you know, uh, the water, the water could get pretty heavy in your emergency go kit. Um, and your go kit, you typically want to have a backpack because it's something you can throw on and proceed in the forward motion quickly. Um, in your kits that we're giving you today, we do have packets, uh, like a sample of a um, emergency drinking water that comes in a packet, um, and it, it's good for five years. So instead of carrying around bottles of water, that's also, um, you know, a good solution to keep your bag light. Once a year we get a uh, notice uh, from the county to replace our batteries for uh, 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 smoke detectors and, uh, and so on. I would, and, and you mentioned what you need to do once a year. Uh, I take that as a, uh, uh, an alert to renew all these documentation and all these things. But as far as Food, emergency food supplies and canned food. After that, that you need to look at the expiry dates in your pantry to make sure that they can still last another year. Or you can use them and replace them. So I will say, if you're signed up for my functional needs registry, um, I do send out those messages. I do send out a message um, for daylight saving time twice a year that tells you about updating your kit, tells you about doing all that kind of stuff. Um, it does go out to around 1,000 people that are on the functional needs registry, and then it goes out to another 10,000 people um, that are signed up just for our general newsletter, and then we do send it out to all 15,000 um, county employees as well. So um, if people are signed up, they definitely are getting those messages. Um, we do a lot of messaging about this. Um, you know, we are doing um, PSAs about it. You can find us on Channel 16. Um, almost monthly, doing kind of segments like this. Um, but there's there's a lot of a lot of stuff that we're doing to remind people, um, you know, to keep their their stuff updated. What's your opinion about these little bracelets or things that you can you can get to wear and there's some central number or somewhere that that the EMS person could call to get information. So I'm not familiar with that. I, do you do you guys use that at all? We don't. No. Yeah. So yeah, and I think it would be um, more of a fire, life, and safety question. Um, I can bring that back and and get back to you with that answer if you want to leave me your. I've got. I don't know where I got them, but they're little flyers. Mm -hmm. Uh, you can sign up, your name and address and all the other stuff, and put it on a little bracelet. Okay. You have to pay for them to keep your... I, I think maybe to get registered for initially. I know for our purposes at the 911 Center, um, on certain medical situations that uh, you might call for you or a loved one, um, <coughs> one of our favorite questions we ask is, is the patient wearing a medical alert sign? So I'm not sure if that would be the same. Thing. But um, but we do cover that when it, uh, it seems like it. We try to standardize as much as we can. When it seems like it won't apply, uh, we do ask that question in the hopes that the responders, when they uh, get to the emergency, are you know looking for that. Jesse, would you guys use that at all? Yeah. I would. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's definitely not like, you know, for children that have allergies, um, I could definitely see that being, being important. Um, I'm not sure that we have a protocol here to use it besides um, asking, but I can definitely yeah. test base with the fire department and see if they, on EMS calls, would use that. 
I would just like to maybe share some inspiration as a self-advocate, I'm a public speaker as well, on how wonderful these workshops are and how necessary it is that we all just communicate and share each other's experiences together. Because we are nationwide, all our chapters are working on these very issues constantly, and our voices do make a difference. And I'd just like to share a few examples. Inova Hospital in Lansdowne recently made an accommodating ER space and accommodating ICU space for patients on the autism spectrum scale. And that came around because they heard about the population in the area with autism. Same thing, 2017, Cobb Theater started applying sensor sensitive movie screenings to their schedule. They say the movie theater will be popular among the children and they offer scheduled sensor sensitive screenings. Maybe that's because the Ark of Loudon was arranging once a month on a Saturday a sensor sensitive screening movie for our families and we were bringing over a hundred plus people to see that. So they again saw the audience of people in their community that they were not serving and they made a change. So life is tough and when you have a disability, gosh do I know how much more difficult it is. I have several hidden mental imbalances, but I was blessed with a voice to communicate with. So I speak on behalf of everyone who is affected by intellectual and developmental disability. And I just want to encourage you to continue with your art chapter, continue with your small community group support group, and continue using your voice. Go out and talk to the people, the places that you, your child, or your parent, the client, goes to and see what accommodations can be made. It can happen. No, thank you so much. And you're exactly right. And, um, you know, even for sheltering situations, um, Jesse was saying for health department um, clinics um, during, you know, public health emergencies, how they have um, accommodating spaces. In shelters, we also have accommodating spaces. Um, one of the things that, that we are working on as well um, in the county, but also with our community partners, um, is putting together a functional needs guide, and that's going to help individuals who are not um, you know, well-versed or who haven't taken the CIT training and who, who are not normally um, interacting with individuals with disabilities and giving them resource and access to um, tips, tricks, and where the resources are to be able to provide accommodations mm -hmm. or answer questions, um, how to replace equipment quickly. Um, if, you know, if there's a fire and we need to replace someone's wheelchair, we already have those connections built. If you're not getting what you need, it might be because that person just doesn't know. Um, and that's what this guide is really for, is to really aid in executing um, our response and our services even quicker. And we have full county support. Um, you know, our head ADA coordinator for the county um, is super supportive. We're working with the Disability Services Board, um, you know, and, and other agencies that we work with on a regular basis to, to get input so that we can not only share this amongst ourselves, but have it be a resource for Fairfax County um, and beyond. So one of the other things, one of the other cool things that we are doing um, for sheltering is um, the state has put together um, a proposal to have an ADA coordinator in each state man shelter um, with connections back to the Emergency Operations Center. And here in Fairfax County, we are working to um, use that model to do it here as well because we think it is really important to be able to, um, you know, serve our, our public in those general population shelters and make it as inclusive as possible. So um, by adding, you know, these resources, um, we're hoping that this, um, this process, as terrible as it is, if we ever had to open a shelter, um, to make it as seamless as possible. We've heard an awful lot of good suggestions today. Do you have a, an overall checklist that we can go down? Yes. 
I do. So it is in the back. Um, and then everything we talked about here today um, in the PowerPoint, we, we do have a brochure that has a little bit more information. And then it also has my contact information on the back. So if you have additional follow-up questions, um, I would be glad for you to email me, um, and I will filter those out to the appropriate individual who would handle that. I was wondering, um, do you have any resources on, on electrical generators, you know, if you were considering purchasing one? Because that's the issue for my family is the loss of electricity. And actually, my younger son lives in a group home now. Okay. But um, when the, in the incident in March, when we had a wipe, the, his home lost power. And so the other individual went to another facility operated by the provider okay. because they knew that my son would not do well in that environment. They kind of like said, um, can he come home, you know? So I luckily was going out of town, so I said bye-bye, but <laughs> anyway, but my husband was with my son for about 32 hours with no, no power. power, no heater anything and you know it's just there are individuals that that won't do well in a shelter yeah so <coughs> we're kind of like keep like a shelter in place type of for every yeah this kind of person so you know you just wonder like my husband has talked about that i think he's a little bit crazy maybe but you don't want to you know you want to get something appropriate but you don't want to be like ripped off and you know the pros and cons yeah of what you should even buy if you were thinking about doing something like that. So, during tax free weekends in August, um, you can actually go and buy emergency preparedness supplies um, tax free. Okay. So, I would, my personal suggestion would, I would wait until then because um, it'll save you a significant amount of money. Um, but we don't give out specific information on what generators, um, it's all going to depend on your house. Um, and what you're trying to, to power. Um, so you want to make sure that you're definitely getting the appropriate stuff. Um, yeah, I would, you know, the, the county doesn't necessarily kind of source any generator or, or have expertise to kind of tell you, you know, how to do it or whatever, but I, I have looked into it myself. Um, there, there are some resources online um, that will, will kind of tell you, you know, you can Google how do I take a generator for my home. And there are places that talk you through kind of figuring out what size you need, whether it's going to be the kind of generator that's kind of hard water in your home, or whether it's a generator that you're going to be able to run from the outside, and then tips on using them, like never using them indoors and things like that. Um, so there are resources online. You know, maybe for a future event, we can kind of take a good thought that's link and include that. Yeah, we should include that. Have it here, but there are tons of resources online that, that, that give you that kind of stuff uh, because it is really important. It's not cheap, but that tax-free weekend for big pieces of equipment like that can actually save you significant money. Yeah. I can tell you, I spent a little over $1,000 for my generator because I live out in the country and I lose power often. And for, for my needs, I did exactly that. I researched it and I figured out $1,000 would do what I need to do, run my refrigerator, basic lights, run my well pump, stuff like that. You don't need a tremendously big one. Right. Yeah. Yeah, and that's, I mean, I would definitely, yeah, I, I personally would wait till tax-free weekend. It's a great, um, it's a great time to, to buy emergency supplies, especially the ones that are, that are more costly. Um, you know, often, I wouldn't try to do things right after a disaster. Um, that's often, you know, prices go up and down. Um, but well, right as before. Huh? You got a hurricane coming, and you yeah. the day before it hits to go buy something, <laughs> yeah. you're not going to find it. Yeah, you're not going <laughs> to find it. Uh, it's definitely not going to be on sale. Um, so start thinking for the, you know, a, a season ahead is what we say. Um, think, of, you know, we're approaching winter. So plan now. Not, don't try to go get a snow shuffle, like, when it's snowing. Um, you want to... I guess I'm sort of surprised that the state, you know, or, you know, I mean, it, it all gets complicated and stuff, but, you know, like you have, like, you know, residential facilities or something like that, it seems like that would be a good investment that they would have minimal things so that people could mm -hmm. save where they're... Just preaching to the choir. Yeah. 
even even nursing facilities and other healthcare facilities have a requirement for a generator, mm -hmm. but they don't have requirements for critical things like HVAC systems yeah. to be able to maintain your temperatures. It has long been a significant issue for the healthcare industry. Right. Um, and and you know we make efforts that you know well, it's never by local code. It's always CMS regulations, you know, state law, federal law that that guides those things. So. You know, if it were a local county ordinance, we would have some sway to be able to make those changes. Unfortunately, it's not. But we do um, promote that issue in our work at kind of the regional and state level because that's what that's what really drives evacuations from nursing facilities and other types of, of, of healthcare facilities that we're talking about. Um, other than kind of just a quickly evolving kind of flooding situation, it's the temperature going out of range. And that puts lives in danger to where it didn't have to be otherwise. And they don't do it because it's expensive. Because the HVAC takes more power than anything else. And if you put your HVAC on a generator, you're going to need a larger generator and more fuel, and it's more expensive. And corporate offices won't pay for it. Um, it it's, a, it's a tremendous issue. They should all have them. Yeah. Uh, I'm registered with the Perfect Excellence System. Uh, in 2010, or I think early 2011, I was working in Iraq, and I got the alert for an earthquake. Mm -hmm. And I was able to call my family back here to make sure that they were safe or they they were uh, prepared for that. Uh, it's a it's a very important system for our disability community. Uh, you will receive a lot of uh, alerts, and when you receive those alerts, it's going to be bugging you. <laughs> but it is a sign that you are registered no. with Fairfax County, and it's an assurance for you. What? Since then, we haven't had an earthquake or a major fire or a major disaster, but uh, I still receive it every day. And I just take a quick look at it and and delete it. Don't get bored of it uh, or forget that you, the, uh, the importance of it. Too. Yeah, because, you know, if we do know that our, an emergency is coming, we will send out preparedness tips. We will let you know for pre-opening a shelter. We will give you directions on what to do. Um, so, yeah, you might, and, and here's the thing. If you don't want to receive the traffic alert from the weather alert, <laughs> you don't have to, okay? There's, there's preferences. Um, if you're receiving too many alerts, we can go in and fix it. Um, <laughs> yeah. um, particularly depending on what address you put in. So if you put in multiple addresses, you are getting multiple alerts um, for the addresses that you put in because these are some of these alerts are geolocated. So if you're within an area that is, you know, having an accident um, and it's your work address and then there's one by your home address, you're getting all those alerts. Um, you don't have to get all of them. We can customize that for you. Um, I'd be glad to go in and, and edit those at any time. But you're right. When it's important, you want that alert. Um, and the newsletter too. It's you know it's it's just general tips. You, you know we try to make sure that every month we're we're giving you something an actionable item to do um, and valuable tips. So. Any feedback is appreciated, and whatever we can do to help. I, I was traveling uh, recently, and I registered with the American Embassy, um, and I felt very safe getting my alerts, like stay away from this neighborhood or stay away from the yeah. protests, and that I felt really safe that you know the U.S. is taking care of me. Ah, that's pretty cool. <laughs> All right. Thank you so much. No, thank you for having us. Thank you for today. Yeah, and again, this is our first one, so um, you know we will provide Larry with a um, with a survey link to see how it went. If you have any additional questions, um, you know, please feel free to email me, and and we'll do the best that we can. Just want to make mention for everyone that's joining us online is that we will be uh, sending the presentation <coughs> as well as copies of the slides and other notes to you. Um, later today or first thing Monday morning. Uh, this uh, webinar was also recorded and will be posted on our YouTube channel uh, so that you could watch it again uh, at your leisure or refer, it, refer to it for anyone else that might be interested in this information. 
And I want to thank Courtney and the other representatives for their time today. And it's incredibly valuable information. Several of the respondents online said to thank you and that this was very helpful information. So thank you all for your time today. Yeah, thank you for, for hosting this. Um, we will be doing this um, again several times um, throughout the winter. Um, I think we have two more scheduled right now, and a couple other organizations have approached us about um, planning one in the spring. So we're definitely hoping that this is valuable information and, and to continue to do this. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Please stand by.